On today's show, the Hawks flop in Brooklyn by a 27-point margin, and also the Hawks make a transaction, actually two of them, on the same day for the first time in about three months. We'll get into all of what that is about, all of how they've struggled in the game, and much more, and all that is on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1664 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Thursday evening, the final show of the month of February. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at Grammarly. Make a bigger impact at work with Grammarly. Sign up and download for free at grammarly.com slash podcast. Also, at the top of the podcast, I should tell you to make us your first listen here at Lots on Hawks each and every day. Check us out and subscribe to the show on places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as Overcast. Castbox, Pocket Cast. We're also on YouTube on the video side. And please, please, please subscribe to the show and tell a friend about the podcast. On today's show, we'll focus on what became a blowout loss for the Hawks up in Brooklyn that ended their mini winning streak of two games. Again, it's kind of a big time thud against the Nets in this one. But that'll have to wait for a second because the Hawks have not made a transaction of any kind with the roster in more than three months until today. So we'll leave with that and then we'll come back to the game because I'm sure a lot of Hawks fans were <laughs> sort of uh, want to forget this one in some respects. But uh, December 22nd was the last time the Hawks made a move of any kind with their actual big league roster. And that point is actually not a huge deal at that point. They waived Miles Norris from a two-way contract and then signed V. Krejci to replace him. Fast forward to Thursday, again, on the last day of the month, and they finally rectified that situation and really the never-ending Trent Forrest saga that I've been talking about quite a bit. Uh, the first official domino was that Patty Mills was officially waived by the Hawks, and then they actually converted Trent Forrest st to a standard NBA contract to take Patty Mills' roster spot. A lot to get to here. I'll try not to go down too many rabbit holes talking about this, but obviously, you know, you don't often get transactions in late February into March, so here we are. Um... This is basically a 20-day saga in which Trent Forrest was ineligible to play for the Hawks. I still get asked about this all the time. I know I've done this a couple of different times on the podcast, but he essentially reached his 50-game limit on a two-way contract. So if you're on a two-way contract, you cannot play, actually you cannot be active for more than 50 games during the season. And the Hawks kept Trent up all year long, basically. So he was active almost every night, and uh, he reached that limit on February 9th. That's 20 days ago. So for weeks now... Essentially, I've been telling you that there are really only two realistic options to rectify that situation with regard to, with regard to Forrest. One of those one of those options was basically just to waive Trent Forrest and then replace him on a two way contract. The other option was essentially to waive Patty Mills or Wes Matthews and convert Forrest to a full contract in some way. They chose option B, and for a while I've been leading to that outcome based on what I've been hearing. Part of that is that if they were going to waive Forrest, they probably would have done that already. They didn't have to wait. Any length of time, they could have waived Trent Forrest, you know, 20 days ago. But Quinn Snyder, for instance, uh, not just him, but he likes Trent Forrest quite a bit. Um, and the organization also does as well. So then, sort of as part two of that, I had been hearing that Mills was the most likely candidate to be waived if the Hawks were going to do that. Because the other candidate was Wes Matthews. But because of Kobe Bufkin's emergence and the fact that they basically would be keeping Trent Forrest in this scenario and have two guards there, it made a little bit more logical sense that if they were going to keep Trent, again, if they were going to keep Trent, Patty was the one that made more sense to move on from. And by the way, on that front, the timing to kind of go ahead and do this now for Patty Mills gives him a chance to sign elsewhere. Um, you have to be waived by March 1st, which is literally tomorrow, to be eligible for the playoffs with a new team. And Patty is, of course, near the end of his career at this point. After, obviously, he's been really good for a long time. And he could sign up with a, with a, play on, with a playoff team. I wouldn't be too surprised by that. We will see if he does that. He's all, he's very well regarded. Quinn Snyder talked about him after this, actually, before the game tonight and gave a glowing report about Patty Mills. Everyone likes Patty Mills. No question about that. He is an older guy, but he can still shoot it. And we'll see where he lands somewhere else, potentially. But obviously, this is a Hawks podcast. So I'll say this. This is not the sexiest result in the world for what could have happened here with that roster spot. Forrest is not a super high upside player. He is limited as a shooter, of course, in a big way for a guard. I do think that he's a fringe NBA player. I think he should be in the league somewhere. So it's not weird on that sense. And I like Trent. Really good defender knows how to play, processes the game well, etc. Um, and the Hawks, I do think, feel comfortable playing Trent Forrest if they need to. Um, I, I saw some collective freakout from Hawks fans today. I don't blame you for this, necessarily. 
that they were going to suddenly play Trent over Kobe Bufkin. That did not happen, mercilessly, <laughs> mercifully, I should say, um, on that side of things. But um, yeah, obviously they could have used that roster spot on something a little, with a little bit more upside, um, and they did not do that, which I understand the frustration. In general, I have not loved what the Hawks have done on the margins this year. They still, right now, have like $9 million under the tax. They didn't use the MLE at all. That's uh, frustrating, and I totally get that. Also, the Hawks converted the two-way to a standard NBA contract. So the word converted actually means something specific here. That terminology points to the, the Hawks basically being able to convert him to a rest of season contract at the league minimum. A team can unilaterally do that. So do that on the road with any two-way contract. You can go ahead and do that if you are the team, if you have a roster spot. And that covers, again, the rest of this season at the league minimum. What would have been better process-wise for the Hawks would have been to give Trent a new contract that had some team-friendly language going into next year, like a non-guarantee or a team option to make it a little bit more friendly. Would the Hawks necessarily pick that up? Who knows? But um, actually, it's super low upside for the team because now Forrest is in his fourth season in the NBA. He's going to be unrestricted as a free agent at the end of the season. Again, not the biggest deal in the world. I'm not going to try to tell you that's, that's this huge game-breaking thing. But just the little things on the margins, like if you're a basketball nerd like I am, they probably could have gotten something of a concession from Trent and his agent on next year, but they didn't do that, and uh, some meatlets on the bone as a result of that. So that's kind of the, what's going on now. As for the open two-way slot, because that's the, that's the other part of this, is that the Hawks, doing the sequence of events, you know, they still have an open roster spot. Now, it's not a, it's not a full roster spot, so like a lot of guys can't sign to two-way contracts. Um, there are service time limitations. You can't sign like a 30-year-old guy who's been in the league for 10 years to a two-way. But the March the Hawks have until March 4th to sign someone to a two-way contract. That's, of course, less than a week from now. But they have a little bit of time here. I've been saying for a long time that it was pretty wild to me. The Hawks were still going basically into every game with as little depth in the front court as they've been going with right now. They could sign a front court player, whether it's a forward or a center. At some point, they'll give them some depth if they actually need that. That urgency maybe is a little bit less right now because Mo Gay, um, you know, in, in a positive development, was able to get on the court last night and on Wednesday in College Park. Um, he was limited minutes-wise, looked good in that in that time. He's been out about four months or so. And by the way, the Hawks are not viewing him as a center. He's never been seen by the Hawks as a center, but he's obviously someone who has some size and can play some forward spots. So functionally, as we'll get into later on, actually, with, with regard to the game tonight, the Hawks are limited by the fact that they really only have three forward size players in Johnson, Bay, and Hunter. Plus, right now with the Kongu out, they only have two centers in Capella and, and Fernando. So, um, for example, if they wanted to play Jalen Johnson a lot at center, it's hard to do that because they don't they don't have the forward depth. And uh, why, you know, no matter what, whoever they bring in on a two-way contract probably isn't going to play very much. And that's okay. But what you're looking for is to avoid the disaster scenario. Like, for instance, I'm not saying because this game already happened, I'm not jinxing it, jinxing it. But tonight, if they had had, let's just say, someone gets sick and then you have an ankle turn in the, fr in the first quarter, they would have been in trouble depth-wise in the front court in this game. They only have three forwards and two centers. So anyway, we'll see if they go outside the organization on that two-way contract um, or if they want to stay semi-internal. They could sign Miles Norris again who they, of course, signed the first time to a two-way contract, then waived. Um, but he's been getting better and better in College Park. Um, not a guy that I would be, like, blown away by, but certainly he's young enough to make some sense. He has some skill level, and he has forward size, which is, of course, important there. They could go elsewhere, but again, they have to go pretty quickly here with four days to go. Um, I would say the only disaster scenario would be if they didn't sign anybody at all. They don't have to fill that spot. Now, I think it would be pretty brutal not to, because there's no reason not to. Uh, Two-ways are very cheap. There's no downside to having a guy out of that. So just try to take a shot on somebody that you like and see what you have there. So um, we'll probably talk about that, what, what it actually happens, whether it's Norris or somebody else. But um, for now, Forrest on, is on the big league club. Uh, Patty Mills has been waived. Farewell to Patty. And uh, the long national nightmare of 20 days of Trent Forrest being ineligible to play, which, by the way, again, was not, I'm not sure it was unprecedented. I can't find records on this. I've been asking around about this. But it felt like it was a super, super outlier for a team to be carrying an, an eligible player for three weeks in February. Bizarre, but in the end, that is now over. And Trent actually got into the game late tonight, as we'll talk about that in a second. But there you go. That's the transaction cycle for today. And after a break from our sponsors, we'll talk about what became a frustrating performance from the Hawks. They were not very good on this night in Brooklyn. We'll get into all of that, the broad takeaways, the nuts and bolts of the game, the player evaluations, and much more. But first, it worth from our partners on the show. 
Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors and our partners over there at eBay Motors have been teaming up with Lockdown Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd all year long to bring some of the best fantasy basketball picks each week. And whether you're preparing for your daily draft or scouting the waiver wire in your league, every week we'll actually have some players for you that are guaranteed to fit on your fantasy basketball roster. So let's see right now what Josh has picked out for us on this week's edition of eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And there's always a full list of guys for Josh to highlight, but today... We'll be focusing on a Atlanta Hawk. Not always a Hawk on the list, but this time there is one with DeAndre Hunter. And, uh, of course, that local connection is there. I talked about Hunter a lot on yesterday's podcast about the way that he's shooting the ball this year, etc., etc. But Josh is highlighting him um, for different reasons as well. Obviously, it helps to have his best shooting season of his career so far, and he is. He's taking more threes. That definitely helps with fantasy as well. Coming into the night, tonight, he's actually uh, scoring at a high level too, about 20 points a game for about five games. Not quite as good tonight, but still an uptick in production on the whole for DeAndre Hunter. And he's in line for a lot of minutes because of the forward depth the Hawks have. And as he ramps up a little bit more, um, Josh believes that he is a currently undervalued option in the fantasy basketball landscape with the way that he's been playing recently and what he is capable of doing. And again, Josh Lloyd from Lost on Fantasy Basketball is going to help you out with winning your championships this year in fantasy. Even though there's also knows about championship teams and they know that it's also about each player being perfect fit for your, for your roster. It's the same, by the way, for your vehicle, Eddie Bay Motors. I'm on the road a ton for work, covering Hawks games, et cetera, all over the place. And there have been times in the past I need to find upgrades for my car, even just a fixing of a part or two to keep things running and on schedule with my car. And the best possible place to do that is eBay Motors. They have over 122 million parts for your number one ride. You can make sure that your car truck stays running smoothly with eBay Motors. They have brake kits, they have roof racks, bumpers, LED headlights, whatever your vehicle happens to need. eBay Motors will have it covered for you. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money is coming back to you plus at these prices you're burning rubber and crucially not burning cash keep your ride or die alive right now at ebaymotors.com one more time that's ebaymotors.com ebay guaranteed fizz only available to us customers eligible items only exclusion supply all right we turn now to what became a bad loss for the hawks i think it's a little bit earlier but the hawks lost by 27 points they were down by as many as 31 points in the second half of this game they were trounced coming out of the locker room to begin the game. They did recover, got it down to six by halftime. It was never closer than that all the way around, but they were in the game in the middle of it for sure after a nice second quarter by, De by DeJounte Murray. Um, but they got blitz coming out of the out of halftime as well in the third quarter, and then it was over by the early part of the fourth and really total garbage time for like seven or eight minutes in the fourth quarter. It was pretty rough. Our friends at FanDuel made the Hawks only a one and a half or two point underdog in this game, even without Trey and, and Onyeka. Um, the Nets were without two guys as well, Cam Thomas and Ben Simmons, and the Nets have been struggling really badly in recent days. They were 2-8 and eight in their previous 10 games and 7-21 and 21 in their previous 28 games. I talked about them ad nauseum last night on the podcast, and by the way, just look ahead a little bit, a rematch between these two teams on Saturday, so it's all still very relevant. The Nets are not very good, to be candid with you, but in this game, they were the better team by a lot. Um, as far as the broad takeaways are concerned in this one, it was honestly pretty bad on both ends of the floor for the Hawks in this game. I will start with the offense first on this evaluation. They had a 104 or so offensive rating in this game. That's very bad against anyone. And the Nets are also below average on defense. So that combination, pretty rough. Last three games, the Hawks have a 109.8 offensive ratings. Of course, that three game sample size is the non Trey, non Aneka sample size. Um, that number, 109.8, would be a bottom five mark in the league this season. So I'm not sure the Hawks would be a bottom five team in offense without Trey all year long, but I am very convinced at this point that they would be below average on offense with their current roster um, over a large sample size. And obviously his absence is the biggest reason for that. Um, tonight, post game, Quinn talked about not being able to break the paint a lot. That's something Trey does a lot. Um, setting up corner threes, something that Trey does a lot. He's their best passer, all that stuff. It's very obvious if you're not putting the blinders on that the Hawks miss Trey quite a bit on offense. Um, they have only, sorry, they only had one quarter out of the four tonight in which they were statistically average even on offense. And by my count in the last three games, the Hawks have been average, not even great, average or better in four of the 12 quarters on offense. So that's one third of the time they've been average or better on offense. Tough to get by with that. Obviously the defense carried them in the first two games without Trey. Um, it was unsustainably good. Like the opponents had a 92 offensive rating. Um, no matter how good the Hawks are defensively, they're not that good on defense. Like that's that's better than number one by a lot this year. So some regression there. And look, right now, the Hawks have basically one unit they can go to that I think is actually good on offense. And that's essentially that Jalen is playing center. If you have Jalen playing center and you have five out, the Hawks can score. Um, 
the trouble is there defensively you have some limitations we'll say with that with that group but I'm sure I'll mention it again later I think they probably should have gone to that even more which again I'm admitting is not great on defense in this matchup the Nets have weaknesses when it comes to attacking the rim that would have been a little bit able to mitigate the Hawks weaknesses on defense but without Jalen and again sorry with Jalen at center and the Hawks did score much better like when they were actually able to score in this game it was because they were playing smaller and with five out units but anyway it, it is hard to do that all the time right now with their roster and really that should be a change up it shouldn't be like your main unit they have to go to all the time and that comes back to like they have some limitations on offense right now um the biggest thing in sort of beyond this game is kind of the, what I just talked about a little bit but in this game in particular the biggest disparity was the shooting on both sides of the floor so Brooklyn was red hot from three which certainly we'll come back to later on that was a huge factor in this game but the Hawks could not make shots they were 8 of 28 from three in this game uh 43 from the field in this game as well they only created 28 threes that's well below their average and that's something that Trey does really well is set up threes the Hawks didn't do that very well in this game in fact only six corner threes in the entire game that's attempts not makes six attempts from three in the corner that's really low and the shot quality just is not as good as it possibly should be and has it as it usually is for this team and obviously the absences are part of that um admittedly they got nothing basically from Bay and Bogey who are their starting wings um, they were 622 from the floor in this game, a combination of the two of them. Bogey had a good third quarter, like end of the third quarter, but he was really rough in this one. They couldn't make shots too. And Jalen, after he was fantastic on Tuesday, was much more human in this game. So the combination of Bay and Bogey just doing basically nothing on offense, Jalen being just okay, that's really hard to get by with this current iteration of the Hawks. Murray had 28 points. Like Murray scored at the level that you need him to score in this game but it was everybody else nobody else had more than tw- uh, had, four- had more than 14 points in this game that was Jalen um there were no real standouts on offense and even Murray like you if you wanted to dr- sort of draw on a little bit it, w- it was really just scoring he didn't do much else on offense but obviously they had to have that scoring and certainly without him they'd have been even more barren on offense in this game but 18 assists total for Atlanta that's something that Quinn mentioned post game uh I I sort of noticed that as well they just did not move the ball very well and the rotations were not being created by the way the Hawks were playing on offense in this game I took care of the ball okay only 14 giveaways in this one but they led directly to 25 points that's obviously pretty rough so that's circumstantial um they did a decent job on the offensive glass in this game and they did take more free throws than the Nets did but not enough to overcome the shooting gap and also the last thing on the offense they were only the 28th percentile on half court offense in this game they just could not score when they were forced to play slower when they were able to run off of makes uh, sorry off of misses or off of turnovers or whatever they were better on offense which is how most teams operate to be honest with you but when it was actually slow down have to run your offense and score they just were not able to do that other than when they were playing Jalen at center so I'll leave it there for now but you know I think the offense in it's it's only three game sample size but if you were just also using your logic the offense is not going to be the same without Trey that's very easy to see they're not better without him that's a comical notion in general but especially on offense yeah you could argue And I think it's fair to say in a vacuum, the Hawks should be better defensively without Trey because of their, they're playing bigger they're playing Kobe more, et cetera. But offensively the drop-off so far has been even with, even with a two on a two on one record so far has been enormous on offense. They've gone from like a 118, 119 offensive rating down to 109, 110. That is the difference between a bottom five group and a top eight group essentially. And that is a massive difference. So we'll see if that holds long-term here, but uh, pretty rough on offense in this game. Uh, defensively, also pretty bad, honestly. Now, the Hawks were never going to maintain the pace of the previous two games. And that's not their fault. They actually played well defensively. In the, as I said on the podcast both times, the Hawks played well on defense against Orlando. They played well on defense um, against Utah. That did happen. Um, but not as good as the numbers are indicate because nobody's, nobody's that good defensively. In this game, they played better defensively than the numbers indicate. I will say that. They, they allowed a 133 defensive rating in this game to a below average offensive team in Brooklyn and it was well above 140 until garbage time so 130 is in some way sorry 133 is like some ways kind because it did regress late and those were kind of meaningless minutes but on the other side of things the Hawks were I have to say unlucky with three-point defense in this game I mentioned how bad the Hawks shooting was and part of that was shot quality but also they just missed a bunch of shots the Nets did not miss those shots they were 22 of 46 from three that is a lot of attempts, which is something the Hawks can do something about. And Quinn said that after the game, like, obviously you're hoping that they miss some shots, but you can't allow them to take that many. And he's right about that. But also the Nets shot 48% from three on huge volume. So 
that is the second most threes they made all season. Um, that's a little bit on them, a little bit on the Hawks. All that stuff is in there. And as I talked about on the preview last night, and I'll probably say it again on Saturday when, when these two teams play again, the Nets do rely a lot on perimeter shooting because they don't really do anything going to the rim. They're in the bottom five in two-point percentage. They're in the bottom five in field goal percentage. They're in the bottom five in free throw attempts. They don't pressure the rim. But if there's one thing that the Hawks were going to be in trouble if that happened in this game, it would have been the Nets making all their threes, and they did. So that made the score worse than it should have been. The Hawks were not the better team. Even if you were to level out the shooting a little bit in this game, the Hawks were still not the better team. But the margin was, let's just say, augmented by Brooklyn making their shots and the Hawks missing their shots. Um, the Hawks still, though, didn't force turnovers in this game. They allowed 15 second chance, second chance points in this game. Um, they didn't really cover themselves in glory all the way around. So it was an awful performance. Like, I would always stress to not get too high or too low. Um, I got some hate mail, which is expected after the two wins um, for not being, I guess, positive enough or whatever. I talked about how well they played, especially in the in the Utah game. But anyway, I'm sure I'll get the same the other direction tonight. Like, it's one game. Like, I don't, I don't think you throw everything out and the records out and all that stuff. Like, it's a it's a bad loss, but they have an opportunity to even the score on Saturday. I said last night on the show that the most likely result of a two-game trip to Brooklyn is one and one. I still think that's probably the case now. We'll see. Um, but no matter what, like they lost the game. They didn't play very well at all in this game, but it was kind of an outlier as to how bad the shooting was. The offense is a concern. Like it's a real legitimate concern with the way they played the last three games on offense. But hopefully the defense will be better than it was tonight and they'll be able to handle things a little bit better in the rematch on Saturday. All right, we'll have the nuts and bolts coming up in a second as well as the player evaluations at the, at the end of the podcast. But first, a word from our sponsors on the program. Today's show is brought to you by Grammarly, and I host and produce this podcast by myself. It requires sending a ton of emails and making a ton of notes, as I do each and every day, basically. No matter what kind of work you do, how you communicate is really key and paramount, and all of those things about emails and notes and, and reports, and they're all important to the collaboration that you need to get things done in your workplace. And Grammarly can help with all of that stuff. Grammarly is your AI writing partner, and they help you communicate more effectively and efficiently to, in order to make the bigger impact that you're looking for at your workplace. When I communicate with different supervisors or managers in the sports writing space, I've also used Grammarly to help me work efficiently and confidently with those notes and reports and things. It saves time, it helps with clarity to get things done that you want to, and they also make, uh, basically the better writing makes a stronger impact in your life. 96% of Grammarly users report that Grammarly helps them craft more impactful writing. And Grammarly works across 500,000 apps and websites. And by understanding writing and context, they provide relevant, personalized suggestions to you. You can make a bigger impact at work right now with the folks at Grammarly. Sign up and download for free at grammarly.com slash podcast that is g-r-a-m-m-a-r-l-y dot com slash podcast one more time grammarly.com slash podcast all right and with the uh forest mills news at the top of the podcast probably just a little bit quicker than usual plus it was a blowout so there you go the locker down 18 to 4 at the end of the first five minutes of this game and that was kind of setting the stage for what was what was to come i suppose Brooklyn made five threes in the first five minutes. The Hawks were rough on offense. They were two away from the floor. They scored four points on the first nine possessions of the game. They picked it up after that, I will say, defensively um, for a while. They got back with an eight at one point in time pretty quickly in that first quarter. Um, rotationally, no big surprises. Uh, Hunter, Garrison Matthews were the first subs. Capel played a little bit longer in this game uh, stint-wise than he had previously because I think he's, he's getting his legs under him a little bit more. Um, also had three blocks in the early going of this one. Buff can play back at point guard minutes and uh, actually was pretty good, I thought, in this game. He's kind of one of the only bright spots um, in this one. He also played some alongside Murray, which I think I like to experiment with that a little bit as well. And the one kind of surprise was that Wes Matthews played in this game. So Quinn does not like to go deep in the rotation, but they played 10 guys in the competitive portion in this game. And honestly, I thought Wes looked pretty good. Um, played four, he played 14 minutes, had good energy, he hasn't played in a while, so that was probably part of it too. Um, but a 10-0 run by the Nets... Late in the first quarter, put the Hawks down by 18 points. And the Hawks had a season low, 16 points in the first quarter. They had five turnovers, and they were 6 of 24 from the field in that period, including an 0 of 8 from Bogey, Bay, and Johnson combined. That obviously hurt them in the big picture. So from there, they never led. They were within 6 at halftime, but um, the damage was, was kind of done. Now, the rest of the game, that was they still lost it, but it was, it was much closer they had a 9 run, though, in the, in the second quarter. Actually, threes by Bufkin and Wes Matthews. That's just how you draw it up a little bit. Um, they were within six by the middle of the, of the quarter uh, after a three-point play by Capella. 
Um, they did try to win right for that. I thought Murray, though, was really effective in that second quarter. He had a couple threes, including one late, and he had 14 points in the second quarter alone. And uh, they were able to get into the halftime break down only six, despite really bad shooting from everyone but Murray. But the rest of it was not kind. So in the third quarter, that's when the wheels came off for the really for the last time and the second time in the game. Um, a 9-2 run at the start for Brooklyn, and they actually allowed 27 points in the first seven and a half minutes of the second half. Some of that was bad luck, I have to say. Brooklyn made a couple of contested threes in that stretch, but still, it was really not good defensively at all. They were down 20 when that barrage ended. I thought Quinn should have gone smaller and faster at that point in time. I think it can be overstated sometimes. That it's got to be just too much of a fix all the time. And look, I, I talked about this previously this week. The numbers defensively when they play Jalen at center are not good. And that's not a surprise. That's kind of a natural NBA thing. When, when you get smaller and better on offense, you often get worse on defense. That's kind of the trade-off. But in this game, as I said earlier in the podcast, it would have been a good time to try it more because the Nets don't get to the rim. and they don't, When they get there, they don't make the shots to the rim. So it is challenging because of the roster construction, but I thought Quinn probably should have gone to that a little bit more. Would that have changed the whole game? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think it was underutilized at times in this one. Probably a little bit too much Bruno, for instance. They went to jail and finally down 21 in the third quarter. Bogey had his best stretch of the night. Um, Buck had a nice drive, but they were kind of still just trying to get back in the game. They were down by 19 points at the end of the third. And then the game was basically over in the first three minutes of the fourth quarter. The Nets had the ball for the for literally the whole first minute of the fourth quarter. They got three offensive rebounds on one possession and then scored. And then the Hawks went empty. Brooklyn hit a three, and it was down by 24, and it was all but over with 10 minutes to go. They were down by as many as 31 with seven minutes to go in this game. And honestly, they should have pulled the plug earlier. Now, it is hard to pull the plug all the way when you only have 11 players active. Like, that's hard to do. But I thought Kobe should have played more in the fourth quarter because the game was kind of over. It's like, all right, play your young guys. And he's really the young, the only young guy that's available right now. Um, more for us, maybe. But anyway, getting Capel off the court would have been a good idea at that point. Hunter, guys who are managing injuries. Alas, it didn't really matter too much, and the end result was a 27-point loss that was, uh, in some ways, indicative of how the game flow went. In other ways, that three-point despair. Just one more time here. The Nets took 18 more threes than the Hawks, which that's the problem. That is, at least that's one of the problems, is allowing that many threes and taking that few threes. But the Nets made 14 more threes than the Hawks did in this game. Made. Not took. Not took. Made. Just for reference there, the Hawks are number six in the league this year in three-pointers per game. And they make less than 14 per game. One more time. The Hawks are number six in the league in three-pointers per game at less than 14 per game. And the Nets made 14 more threes than the Hawks did in this game. And there you have it. To the players at the end of the podcast. Um, We'll fly through this a little bit because the results were not fantastic. Um, Off the bench first, um, Forrest played five minutes. His first action 20 days. He looked fine. I actually thought he played really well in the G League last night. And, and then had to fly up separately to New York. So I'm sure he was a little bit uh, woozy when he when he arrived, but I thought he was fine in this game when he, when he finally came in at the very end. Garrison Matthews didn't score in 11 minutes, actually 0-4 from the floor. Did have uh, three rebounds and was, was competitive, but uh, wasn't fantastic at all. Uh, Wes Matthews I thought was pretty good, actually. Um, he had not played in a rotation role in about three weeks, but five points, had two blocks, had five rebounds, played really hard. Um, I'm not sure he can like, keep up that level of physicality all the time, but he was fresh, and that was very apparent, and that West was a helpful contributor um, playing basically small ball four a lot when he's out there. Um, Bruno was really bad, I thought. It was definitely his worst game since Okongo went down. Uh, Bruno's been okay, actually, since Okongo went down, but not tonight. He was, uh, it was two points in 18 minutes, minus 18. Did have two steals, but was uh, not executing very well on offense or defense. Just kind of a rough one. And that would have been my my gripe. Like, I think, obviously, Capella wasn't fantastic either, but he was much better than Bruno. And I think if you were to take some minutes from Bruno and give him a jail at center, it would have been a little, a little bit better. But anyway, leave it there for now. Um, Hunter was fine. He wasn't as good as he's been recently. at 12 points um, and, and a steal in 26 minutes. Missed his first two threes, made, made, made his third one, but wasn't dynamic. He was okay. He wasn't bad, just kind of out there. The bright spot off the bench was Kobe Buffett. So Kobe had 12 points, took, actually took 11 shots, which I was encouraged by. Took five threes, made two of them, three assists, three rebounds, pretty good defense at the point of attack. He actually was a uh, second best on the team and plus minus at zero. It's a 27 point loss, so that's very helpful. Kobe looks good, um, but not much to add there. He's been good um, all the time when he's about when he's been out there. So 
Doesn't mean you got to suddenly play him 40 minutes a game, but I think he's been uh, giving them a lot on offense. Um, on offense tonight, I thought he was pretty good, and then defensively, he's been very strong in his time so far. To the starters, uh, Sadiq Bey, six points in 30 minutes, two of nine from the floor, 0 of two from three. The shooting's been a little bit rough for Sadiq um, most of the year. It was rough in this game. Uh, defensively, he was actually, at least he was competing, I'll say that. Uh, Sadiq always gives good physicality, and that could be very helpful to kind of keep things on the rails. He's actually only minus two in the game, 30 minutes, but there you go on that. Uh, Capella, not his best, kind of a roller coaster, actually. Some nice highs. He had four blocks in 21 minutes, actually three or four from, three or four from the floor, seven points, um, six rebounds, but also had four turnovers, a couple of really bad. There's one in transition that was just awful. Um, don't even know what he was trying to do, to be honest with you. So certainly not his best work, um, but he's looked better physically. Uh, maybe, not, maybe not as good as he was on Tuesday, but uh, he was not he was not the problem. He was minus 14 in a game lost by 27. So there's that. But uh, he wasn't great either. Um, Jalen, it wasn't on him, but he actually was the game worst minus 38 in this game. They did lose the minutes, I believe, overall when he was playing center, even as well. So it wasn't like it was that was a foolproof plan. Uh, 14 points on 12 shots. That was fine. Five rebounds. No assist for Jalen is actually shocking to see, but uh, two blocks. He was not a disaster, um, despite the plus minus number. Um, certainly was not as good as he was on Tuesday when he was, when he was their best player, but he was just kind of eh. Uh, Bogey struggled in this one, 11 points on 13 shots. Um, it was better in the second half. He was really bad in the first half, like really bad. Um, found his footing a little bit, but defensively, it was a mess. Uh, Murray had a big second quarter and a big first half with 20 points. He was not quite as good in the second half, but still had 28 points to lead all scores for the Hawks. Um, five assists, six rebounds, minus 22. He wasn't, like, really getting into the sets quickly, but he was shooting the ball well, which kind of masked that a little bit. Defensively, no one was good, so I don't want to pick on Murray at all. Um, he was, you know, he was their most productive player by a wide margin on offense, so there's that. But uh, I don't think anybody, I would say, played above their norm in this game. Maybe, uh, you, maybe you would say Bufkin and Wes Matthews would be the guys that you would be like, all right, they give you more than you asked them to do. Murray was kind of what you expect, which is good. I mean, it's not like you're throwing that away. 28 points, six rebounds, five assists. Like that's, they, need, they needed that and they got it. But that was kind of like average for him in this setting when you factor it all in. Um, you know, Jalen was probably below average. Bay was below average. Boogie was below average. Capello was probably below average. Maybe average at best. Hunter below average. Bruno was brutal. Um, Garrison was not good. So yeah, it's, they lost 27 points. Not a huge surprise that no one was great, but they no one was great in this game. So from here, I will be done rambling on this podcast. The Hawks play the Nets again on Saturday afternoon. Same venue. We will see if the Nets injury report is the same, but the Hawks probably will be unless somebody pops, pops up later with an injury. We know Trey and Aneka are going to be out, so it'll be similar on Atlanta side. We'll see on Brooklyn. Ben Simmons was kind of a late scratch today. He changed the theorem a little bit, but he's not the same guy that he used to be by any means anyway. And then we'll see on Cam Thomas. But uh, yeah, rematch there. The Hawks will probably be similarly small underdogs, if I had to guess. Also, the only game... In that time slot on Saturday, 3 p.m. start. A little bit of an odd start time. And uh, some probably some extra eyeballs on that one because it's the only game in town for those first two hours of that game. So stay tuned for that. And we'll have a new podcast afterwards, as we always would on the show. And uh, hopefully, if you're a Hawks fan, as people, I'm sure, mostly listening to this podcast or watching this podcast on YouTube are Hawks fans. But uh, hopefully a better performance than it was tonight. Stay tuned for that. Please subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Ratings, reviews, likes, subscriptions, all that stuff is appreciated. Also, share the podcast with your friends. That's very helpful across platforms. Follow the show on Twitter, at Lots on Hawks. Follow me there as well, at BT Roland. I also write about the Hawks and share audio and clips and all that kind of stuff at patreon.com slash BT Roland as well. Thanks for listening. I know it was kind of a dismal night for the Hawks, but obviously some transaction stuff earlier in the day and then uh, a game to, get, to kind of dive into as we always would on the podcast. So we will probably not have a show between now and Saturday because there's a quick turnaround and not too much going on, but I'll be back after the game on Saturday, on Saturday afternoon slash evening. And with all that said, we'll see you all next time.